Welcome back to the Black Carnivore live stream. It is so good to see all of you. We're really excited to be here today. And uh, today I actually wanted to talk about, um, you know, tips for people just getting started with carnivore. So, you know, I noticed that we have like a lot of new people starting, but we also have a lot of really experienced, amazing people who are doing really well on, uh, on carnivore. So what I wanted to do today was kind of, you know, talk about like our best tips and tricks and hear from the veterans who are in the chat. So make sure if you know the answer, if you have some suggestions and things that you wish you knew when you started, definitely put it in the chat and we'll go over it. And I'm sure you'll all start to notice I'm going to start posting um, before and after pictures of, uh, you know, success from people in our community. So I'm going to start posting that on Instagram. So if I haven't reached out to you, then, um, you know, to ask you for permission, then definitely, uh, you know, let me know. Send me a picture. Tell me what you want posted, because I, I definitely want to make sure that people see how successful we are. So with that, let's just dive right in. And uh, please don't mind me. I'm sweating because it is like a million <coughs> degrees here in New York and it is hot wherever, you know, and I do have air conditioners. I've got air conditioners going in two rooms, but I live in an old brick building and I get uh, sunlight all day long. So it basically nice. turns the whole building into like a pizza oven. And, um, you know, without AC, it, it would get up to be like 108 degrees or something in here. And with a AC, it's like 80. So it's hot. You, you have a glorious team, and that is all we will say about that. Yeah. Yeah. So how about you? What's going on in your world? Have oh, you gotten your salt game as together? As far as AC? <laughs> oh, no, no. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, I've actually been pretty regular this week. Not had a ton of problems, um, and have not like done anything stupid that I can think of. So it's been a pretty, it's been a regular couple weeks for one. Well, that's good. That's good to hear. I'm glad to hear yeah. it. It's always nice when we we don't do something stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. It's so easy. It's so, especially the salt thing. Like, I I get on here and I preach about biohacking and I tell like biohack. I want people to stop that. And then I go like, oh, I need more salt. I can get salt this way. I can do this. Put it under my tongue and do that like four times instead of just like once. Um, mm -hmm. Or I'll salt up this water and drink this and then get myself a salt flush. Yeah, like. It's stupid. Just we're probably not meant to get much salt by drinking it. So <laughs> I'm actually laughing because of Melanated Meat Fueled Mama's um, a point that she just raised in the chat. But we're gonna come Ooh. back to that. But yes, yeah. drinking salt, drinking a lot of salt. Um, you know, you got to be careful not to give yourself that salt flush. And um, yeah, so that that sucks for sure. But getting the salt yeah. in, it is a really big deal. You're totally right. We may as well start with that. Let's let that be number one um, issue. Yeah. But like, you know, I so I was working, I'm working with clients and I, I had one who was really struggling with like headaches and fatigue over, you know, over the a few days before we met up. And um, while on the Zoom call, she put salt under her tongue and I could visibly see her improve. So mm. it, it is, um, you know, it is significant. Not getting enough is significant. And um, if you do that, you know, emergency, a pinch under the tongue, you can actually see the person get better. I mean, it's very quick. Um, you know, so I've, I'm sure I've said this many times before, but there is a major blood vessel that goes underneath your tongue and it's really close to the surface of the skin. So if you leave anything um, sitting in the bottom of your mouth and don't swallow it and you just let it absorb there, it absorbs right into your bloodstream. If you swallow the salt, then it has to go all the way through your digestive system before it gets, you know, out to wherever it needs to go. But if you just let it uh, dissolve underneath your tongue, it's going to get, a, a, you know, absorbed. Like you should be able to feel a difference within like, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. If you're not feeling, you know, a difference in that time frame, then there may be something else going on. And, um, you know, but I find, so that is good for like an emergency. It's not going to make you feel great. 
but it's going to make you feel a lot better. But I find that when you get to that point where you're really feeling bad because you haven't had enough salt, for me, it takes like all day to kind of recover. You know, it's not something where, you know, you just take the salt and you're like, okay, let's go. Let's get, go continue on in our day. It's like you feel better, but you still feel pretty bad. So it is important to me to not let it get to that point because it really will ruin a day. Yeah. And that's, that's where I think I was messing up was I was trying to get to perfect um, in a faster way. So I was like, I put the salt under my tongue and then like two hours later, like do it again mm-hmm. and not feel a difference. So then I think, oh, well, I must need more salt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. So wait, so did you feel like you got too much or what, what was the problem? Well, uh, yeah, I would get to, yeah, it would be too much, but like too much too much feel like for you? It just feels thirsty. So that's not really a problem. I guess more so what I'm saying or what I should be saying is the bad idea was that then, uh, the pinches of salt under the tongue aren't enough. I should drink the salt too, but yeah, the pinch under, I'll do that. And it's been, it's been really uh, jiving up with your experience, with what you said, that like, it takes a while, like that, the pinch is going to help you not fall the out starts on the street. Leave feeling better. <laughs> It'll keep yeah. you from falling out on the street, but it's not going to make you feel good. Right. It does take a whole day. It takes me like actually waiting until I get hungry and eating food that I have then properly salted and I will, you know, continue feeling better but yeah it doesn't happen yeah and you do have to remember too like if you're gonna fast or if you like just have a day where you don't get to eat and you go this really long time period you know eating is a a significant way that you get sodium in so if you don't eat you're not getting that salt and so you you Mm kind of still have to replace it and that's something that you have to remember as well so if you're not going to eat, that's okay, but you still need the electrolytes in the water. Right. Yeah. So, uh, well, so I'm glad you've gotten that together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, not not drinking anymore. Oh, you know what I have been doing, though? Uh, I've been making a lot more roast lately, chuck roast, so I've been mm-hmm. drinking more broth, and I do put a significant amount of salt in that. Like for every eight ounces, I'm doing a quarter teaspoon of salt. Nice, excellent. So you're turning on the oven in this weather, huh? No, I'm turning on the Instapot in this weather. Oh, I have that's not. Right. My oven has not been touched in a month. It's been a while. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've yeah, pretty much hot just oven, like, hot house. Yeah. Yeah. I Well, I took a brisket down, and I am going to have to turn on the oven tonight. I think I'm going to try to mm. do it overnight while I sleep. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. But I don't I don't like it in the Instant Pot, so... Uh, may, I don't know. Maybe I'll just have to suck it up and put it in the Instant Pot, because it would suck to put on the oven, for sure. Yeah. Um, why don't you like it in the Instant Pot? I don't like wet meat. <laughs> I oh, like oh, it right, dry, right. you know. I I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of over brisket, too, I think, for a little while. I mean, until I get a smoker or, you know, some fast, fantastic barbecuer comes over and does it. You know, I don't know. Understandable. Yeah. So, uh, let's go back to Melanated Meat Fueled Mama, because this is important tip oh, number right. two. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> don't 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 drink rendered fat so what does rendered fat mean usually when i say that to people they don't know what rendered means so what does rendered mean it is melted fat Mm -hmm. so not the solid fat not the (coughs) excuse me not the white bits that are on your uh your ribeye or your chuck roast or whatever not those this is the melted fat at the bottom of the bowl at the bottom on top of the broth if you made a rose that stuff mm-hmm. 
And it's also like, um, I would, I, you know, I would put butter in that category. And if you buy um, tallow or lard, like in a jar or in some kind of container, that's also rendered. So when it's hot and it's liquid and it's, you know, clear and pourable, that's rendered fat that can be really difficult for people. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so s some people can eat it when it's room temperature and it's not a problem. I find that very unpalatable, so I don't do that. Mm -hmm. Butter, I, 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 I have to eat that, you know, out of the fridge, but. And I can do a little bit of butter out of the fridge or even at room temperature, a small amount. I can eat some, um, but for me, too much fat period is a problem and especially rendered fat. Mm -hmm. um, so she says she unintentionally drank rendered fat. Uh, she's not even a beginner. She's paying for it. She's got a crying cat emoji. I, yeah, you will pay. That stuff will run through you. Um, the theory is that because it's liquid, which means it's not in the natural form because the fat doesn't occur that way and um, we wouldn't normally eat it that way, that it doesn't sit in your digestive system for the amount of time that it's supposed to and that's why it like runs through you and then you'll end up with fat on the back end yeah yeah <laughs> on the back end <laughs> exactly exactly so um but you know i feel like you know to a certain extent when you start eating carnivore you know you, you have this feeling i should eat nose to tail i should eat all parts of the animal and so you get this feeling like oh man i'm wasting this really valuable thing when i'm not eating it so i should drink it and um you know and i just want to say like don't feel that way <laughs> Oh, I mean, for all time, I'm sure with, you know, I mean, if you look through human history, like we have used the entire animal for a lot of different things and oil and fat has been used as, you know, like a lamp or fuel or, you know, for lots of different things that are not, you know, us eating it. So don't feel like you have to eat it all, you know, just eat as much as your stomach will allow for. But um, one thing I've noticed is that I, I feel like I am much more sensitive. Like I really, uh, you know, each bite of food I take, like I'm enjoying the bite, but I'm also like paying attention to how it feels going down. And I check in with my stomach with each bite. Like, are we done? You know, how, do you like this piece? Do you not like it? You know, is it too much protein, too much fat? You know, is it just right? And um, when I there are those times when I try, you know, drinking some of that fat and there's, you know, and my stomach will kind of send a message. No, don't do this. And so I stop, <laughs> you know, so I never get to the point where I've gone too far, but I do think that your body tells you, sends you signals, you know, very quickly, you know, it's not like you got to wait until, you know, hours later or next week or whatever. It's like instantly mm -hmm. your, your stomach will give you feedback. This is good. This is not good. So right. it's only on you to ask, because <laughs> if you ask the question, you'll get an answer immediately. Yes, like I, um, I am very much a proponent of listening to your body, and I know, especially in fat, I've talked about this a bunch of times on this show before. Like I can feel when my body says that's too much fat, and it mm -hmm. like I feel the fat still on my throat, and it, it feels like any more is going to make me throw up mm -hmm. so i know that by that point i've probably already started to go too far yeah and i definitely need to stop yeah. yeah 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 so she says that she poured it back into her food and finished the bowl she was fine until she wasn't mm -hmm. my guess is if you had slowed down you might have realized when it was too much Mm -hmm. And also just pouring it back on, I don't know, it sounds awesome, but it's never worked out for me. Every time I've done that, like, it may have tasted really good in the moment, and then, like, two, three bites in. 
Well, I pour it back in, you know, I pour it all into the bowl or in, onto the plate, but then when I'm done eating, there's just a whole big puddle of fat on the plate or in the bowl. So that's how it is for me. But, you know, the mm. thing to do as well, I mean, I also, part two of that question, I also see people asking, where do I get fat? Should I buy, you know, this stuff at the store? Where do I buy tallow and where do I get this and what kind of fat do you use? And, um, you know, once you've been doing this a while, like, I don't see a need to buy fat more than once or twice a year. Um, and then you just keep collecting, like, what you make. Like, every day, there's a new, like, batch of yep. fat that I'm kind of like, what do I do with this? <laughs> right. So, right. yeah. I have, I have two, I have a plate full of uh, tallow in my fridge. And this is like really good tallow it's like white it's not even yellowish um well i guess the white versus yellow seems to be the grass fed versus grain fed but like it's really clear is what i mean like there's no contaminants in it um i have that sitting in my fridge it's like probably uh, about this tall now so i could make a bunch of soap if i want to i've started trying candles with the tallow um so yeah I have <laughs> nice all that um, and I put it on my skin and then I have a similar thing of lard that I will make soap out of because it doesn't go well for other things. I guess I could have put it on my skin. Well, it is. It so it is important for people to remember, like as you're saving your fat, do separate the different animals. So don't mix in the lard and the, the tallow. Yes, I would not do that. Yeah, yeah. I would definitely keep them separate and like they're their profiles are different. So I would want them separate for that reason too. And the smell is different. So different applications. I mean, there could be a reason why you smell in one and you might mind the smell in another one. Well, there could be a reason to mix like tallow and lard. Like, let's say you want a softer fat that's, um, you know, softer, even at cooler temperatures, that would be a reason (laughs) to mix them. But I don't know what that would do. Cause yeah, they do have very different profiles. Like, they have different properties. They don't. They don't function the same in cooking and and you know whatever. So you. Yeah. Uh, so if you're saving them, just keep them separate. And um, the other important thing that nobody talks about, and I had to ask you specifically about this area before I finally got an answer. But you have to clean your fat, right? Oh, so yeah. Yeah. when I finish eating and I have that puddle of fat on my plate. I'll put the whole plate in the refrigerator and then the next day I might reuse that fat to cook in. But I'm only going to do that for a day or two or three, no more than that. Because, you know, histamines are built up in the, the, the liquid part that's in there. You know, the fat part itself is stable, but there's proteins, there's pieces of meat, whatever, that are in there. And so that part is not, is not shelf stable and won't last forever. You know, it's just, um, you have to separate that from the fat and so remember when you told me that it was like a revelation to learn how to clean your fat yep the short version is uh melt that fat down pour it into a container and then pour in some water so that all those um the heavier bits the bits of food and whatever they'll drop to the bottom of the fat some of them will drop into the water itself some of them will just stay right at that that line um and then let that refrigerate and harden and scrape off whatever little bits of food and stuff are stuck to the fat and then you have cleaner fat and if you need to you can go through that process a couple times yeah so i just pour um you know i boil water and i just pour boiling water onto the fat in a well i use my little pot that's from the instant pot because it's a big pot and you know Mm -hmm. i put it like maybe halfway you know fill uh, fill it halfway with um with uh, boiling water and then you know stir it around mix it up and then let it cool and put it in the fridge and then um i think i've you know i do it once but sometimes i think i need to do it twice so that's what i would do i i usually just do it once too and yeah melanated meat kill mama mentions a cheese salt that's another good idea i use the uh I don't know. Some sort of I use strainer. paper towels. Like, that worked. Well, I line a mesh. Towel, but the fat. 
I line a mesh um, uh, strainer with paper towels, but I do pour it through paper towel. I don't have cheesecloth. <laughs> yeah. I I was um, I had a a bag that was kind of like cheesecloth, but um, I stopped. It, mm -hmm. Every yeah. once in a while, if I if it's really nasty, I'll go through all that effort. But for the most part, the water seems to do it. Mm hmm Yeah. That was a game changer. So thank you, Arian, for sharing that with me. And uh, that really made all the difference. And now I see Tirza McPherson says, oh my gosh, I have felt this. When I started, I was like, keep the fat. It's so good. It was free for all, a free for all. And my body said, oh no, nope, you better regulate this heifer. <laughs> so, and it's not that you can't yeah. eat a lot of fat. It's that it's, it can't be liquid. So the, uh, the alternative to doing that is to buy beef, um, uh, buy beef fat uh, suet or beef fat trimmings or whatever kind of trimmings. Try to buy actual f chunks of fat. And then you mm -hmm. can fry them or, um, you know, or cook them in the air fryer or whatever. You're going to, it's going to render a lot of fat. So you're going to be left with a whole lot more liquid fat that you got to figure out what you're going to do with, but you'll have chunks of fat that you can eat or, you know, just, you know, get the, the fattiest cuts of meat, like Chuck roast, uh, you know, ch um, brisket, sh all the ribs are very fatty, um, you know, oxtail. So get fatty cuts of meat that have solid fat on them and just eat that fat. That's why we always yeah. tell you all to get the fattiest cuts of meat you can. It, it is not, um, it's not the same thing to get a lean steak and add a stick of butter to it. It's not going to do the same thing for your body. It's so much, um, like that, I can't, I've taken to adding some butter to my meat or like to my egg and that like, it's good. I like it, but there's still at this point nothing can compete with just taking the meat as it came like we have this animal and we just we cut a chunk of them here's a roast or here's a steak and it has the fat has the lean parts those um those are still more satisfying than adding fat to the meal. yeah yeah totally so, you know, and don't get me wrong. I mean, butter tastes good. It has a good flavor. So it's not that you don't use it for flavor and accent, but mm -hmm. you, I don't think you should use it as your source of fat. It's just the source of fat has got to just come from the piece of meat that you're eating. And, uh, yeah, you know, I and so that means, idea. yeah. So I was thinking at one point I should do a video, like where I go into the grocery store and kind of point at the meat and like, you know, kind of walk through my thinking about like which pieces I choose and so on. Cause I, I think that would be helpful too. Yeah. And like, you know, I love, idea. yeah. And I love flank and cut short ribs. Right. And so I've been ordering them from whole foods because for some reason, like they're, they've got the fattiest ones I've ever seen. And so when I go to whole foods, it, you know, you can see people's reviews and stuff. Right. Or I go through Amazon to whole foods. And so their review after review of whole foods, flank and cut short ribs are like, this is horrible. This is disgusting. There's only fat on here. Where is the meat? This is such a jip. Like it's just bones and fat and how dare you. And there was a person like, I don't mean to mock her, but she said, this was racist. She's Korean. These are Korean barbecue. And this is not what Koreans serve at Korean barbecue. This is, there's only fat here and, 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 and whole foods is being racist. And I, you know, well, I don't want to mock that because it, racism is everywhere. And sure, I support, you know, I support that. But I was like, man, you just don't know. <laughs> so I was like, how do I get all of Whole Foods, all of their, their ribs? Because clearly mm -hmm. they are just way too fatty for everybody else. But they're perfect for us. Got to find the connection, mm -hmm. like yeah well you gotta le read the reviews and if if people are complaining it's too fatty that's your meat you're right yeah and yeah, i love, love uh to... yeah go ahead but if i like was around i'd love to walk around the grocery store with you filming it and watching you like 
pick up the meat and deciding which one that you actually like. Like, oh, this is the fattier one. And I go, well, what about this one? And you explain why you like mm-hmm. X versus Y or something like that. Yeah. That would be a cool video. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe we can do it like on FaceTime or something or on Instagram oh, yeah. Live. We could do it on mm-hmm. Instagram Live. Yeah. Yeah, we could. So we've got Ann Taylor from Tasmania here. Awesome. And uh, she says, thank you for doing this live. I'm just starting carnivore for the first time. A bit daunting, but starting for 30 days. Not a fan of awful at all. Steak, eggs, etc. Any tips on keeping on track? Um, Find the meat that you like. Don't try to eat things that you don't like. Just eat what you like and um, cook at home. Don't try to do this yeah. out on the road, you know, really try to, to make stuff at home and just, you know, enjoy the food because this is the easiest, tastiest way to do it. What would you say, Arian? Um, yeah, I think especially if you're the first thing that carnivores need to do is actually stick with being carnivore. So whatever works um, you don't like awful, don't eat it. There is mm-hmm. no requirement that you do. If you are, I think she said later on that she eats a lot of eggs already and steaks are fine. Um, not that I can't eat some steak already, but she'd be, or she'd be screwed. So it sounds like she's just looking for general tips. So like, if that's what you like, steak and eggs, do that. Do it every day. There's nothing wrong with that. There is no um, requirement that you do anything special. Um, I had wings for dinner today, and I had ground beef for breakfast. Like, that's perfectly fine. Mm Mm-hmm. And I see, um, well, she's uh, concerned about hyperthyroid. She's, She's hyperthyroid with nodules. And uh, it looks like Melanated Meat Fueled Mama has had the same issues that have reversed while on um, this way of eating. Wow. Uh, So she says hyperthyroid, goiter, nodules, goiters and nodules have all decreased significantly on this way of eating. Nice. Excellent. And uh, Heather G says, get the ribs now before they change them. I'm not sure what that means, but I did see something about California changing their rules about how pigs are to be raised, and so they're expecting it to cause a major shortage in bacon. I don't know if you heard mm-hmm. about that. No, um, I haven't. I heard that announced today, I think, or yesterday. So now the you know pigs will have to be raised in a way like um, I guess they need to have more room and. The, the way that they're raised has to be changed and configured, and so they can't have as many pigs as in the same space as before. I mean, I guess I'm kind of okay with that. I mean, you know, um, I think we should have humane conditions. Right, and if that means that uh, things cost more or are harder to find than what we were doing before, that that indicates that what we were doing before wasn't sustainable and that it was mm-hmm. fine to me like if it, we start to see things not working so mm-hmm. i'm looking at uh, an article on abc that says uh, it requires more space for breeding pigs egg laying chickens and gale calves so yeah i think pigs have deserved more space for a long time as have um chickens i didn't know mm-hmm. cows were uh, uh, overpopulated or stuffed in the small spaces but Mm -hmm. yeah more humane is always a good thing to me yeah well i feel like the the cattle industry has changed a lot because well a lot more um because of mad cow like a lot of things had to change Mm -hmm. and regulations changed then um but things didn't change for for pigs and chicken um, okay, so Marianne says, what am I doing? I mix my fats. I leave them on the counter. I never clean them. <laughs> uh, you're doing everything wrong is what you're doing. <laughs> well, if you ever feel like you're not feeling well, I would. I, that would be a place that I would look to make changes. But if, you know, if you're okay, I mean, you know, I'm sure if the fat is sitting out for a couple of days, it's not a big deal. 
But if it's six right. months and there's still bits of like steak and fat and, and stuff in it, like that's not gonna work. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, but once you clean it, like this stuff can sit in the cupboard. Tallow can sit in the cupboard, I think, for a year and lard at least for six months. So once it's clean, yeah. the fat itself is very stable. Yeah. So um, it depends on your purpose and how much fat you have. What you're doing may be perfectly fine, or maybe you want to refine your process. But also, like, no one, no one comes into carnivore knowing all this stuff, because this is not... Mm -hmm. The most that we're used to, is, as far as me, I'm used to seeing a jar of bacon grease on the counter. That was all we did for keeping fat. Oh, and you know what? The vegetable oil that would get used and reused and reused for frying fish and chicken. You reuse that in your house? I don't. I don't use vegetable no, oil. No, no, no. I mean, when you were growing up. I mean, when you were oh, growing yeah. up. Yeah, my mom was like, that's a lot of oil to go into frying fish and chicken. Now, granted, it was different oil for fish and chicken because you do not want fish taste on the chicken. Right. But, yeah, she let that stuff cool um, and then pour it back in. And, like, at the bottom would start to be this, like, dark, gritty layer. Um, that's all the little yeah. pieces yeah. of burnt up breading. Um, but yeah, she was saying that oil. She wasn't using fresh So did she like strain it? Did she strain it or did she just pour it back in the jar? It didn't look like it was strained. Mm. Yeah. I don't remember what my grandmother did. I know she fried fish, I mean fried chicken, but she didn't do it that often. And we never did it in my you know my house when i was growing up so mm. you know and things like that i just decided were too complicated i didn't know what to do with them and uh i think i i tried to i think i tried to make onion rings once when i was like 11 nearly burnt the kitchen down but mm. um and I had put a, a whole jar of, of Wesson oil in the pot. And I don't know what I did with it. But I'm pretty sure I poured it down the sink. So, and that was like the end of that. And I, I never it did it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know, and I lived in an old building. Like, you know, those pipes were old uh, <laughs> at that point in time. And had already suffered a lot of abuse. But, uh yeah, I mean, like, I just, I, I, nobody, yeah, you're right, nobody really knows. Like, my grandmother, I didn't ask her about those sorts of things, and then she was gone before I really started eating meat again. So, you know, if not for researching this, I wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, we are moving really slowly through this list. Do you want okay, to go all right, speed one? it up. Yes. What's the next one? Oh, I don't remember. I thought you had the list. Uh, let's see. Uh, Where did I put it? Uh, don't be scared of salt. Oh, focus on getting your nutrients from food. Yes. So I do oh, see, yeah. A, yeah, a lot of, I don't know, just a lot of interesting ideas about um nutrients and you know remember that meat is super nutrient dense i know <coughs> people will tell you what we're told and what the media says is that you know meat is good for protein and fat and that's it but you know remember that the meat itself is full of nutrients i mean if you just go through and look at the nutrient profile uh, you'll see that it has, you know, just about everything that you need. There's only a few things that are not in the meat or not in an animal product of some kind. And, um, and then, you know, you have to question how much we need that because people are surviving, you know, just fine without it. So, you know, the vitamin C is the one that is most, um, you know, most discussed. And understand that fresh meat has vitamin C in it. So you're not, you know, it's not a ton, but you don't need a ton necessarily. And if you go back and listen to the Sally Norton interview, you'll see that vitamin C is kind of 
um, kind of the biggest chunk of oxalates that we're consuming on a daily basis. So um, we, we may not, <laughs> we don't even actually need that vitamin C and it's it, in fact harming us. So, yep. um, you know, so there isn't, you're really not missing out on anything when you're eating meat, right? Yeah, that I would totally agree. Like meat is a complete food. You can literally there are carnivores who do this, beef, salt, water. And not only do they survive during that time, but they thrive. And a lot of folks, um, I'm just gonna put this out there because I know a bunch of us, especially new folks, are looking for ways to lose weight. Like if you wanna figure out like what's happening, you wanna get past the stall, I mean salt, beef, salt, water. A lot of times we'll do it like you don't need anything else and i this was one of my suggestions for the list um we tend to a lot of people who um, by the time they get to carnivore they've tried other diets they've tried a bunch of other ideas already and they're used to things being complicated they're used to there being like a need for well okay so you do this you eat this stuff you drink this stuff that's something different than just water. And you also need these supplements. Like there's this idea that we are going to science our way into health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't, th there is no thing like that. You can literally just eat meat and drink water, mm -hmm. have your salt and be fine. Anything that you add on top of that isn't no. I'm not going to say everything's bad. I don't know. There's a lot of things that aren't bad. They won't harm you. But focus on getting your the bulk or all of your nutrition from the food that you chew. Don't try to drink your nutrition. That was the other part of me saying mm -hmm. this. Is don't drink your nutrition. That's me. That's also a lesson that I'm teaching myself. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be drinking salt. <laughs> okay yeah that's true um okay and then your w one of the next points is don't compare yourself to others so take yes. it away arian why should people not compare themselves to others <sighs> So this is a mental lesson versus a nutritional one, but we spend too much time looking at what other people are doing and trying to recreate those results as if our life is their life and it's not. Your body is not theirs. Your context is not theirs. You are living a completely different life in a completely different set of circumstances. So you can look to other people for inspiration, sure, but we cannot get mad when we don't see what's happening for them in our lives when what they're doing doesn't work for us, your journey is going to be unique. And like, I don't, I don't say that to yourself three times fast or something every morning, but like, it's really needed for, I, I see it so much in carnivores, mm -hmm. especially usually the folks who are trying to lose weight. Um, they're trying to fit into a certain size of dress or something like, If you are meant to get there, you will get there. It's going to be in your time, though. It's not going to be on anyone else's time. Mm -hmm. So relax and stop looking at other people and thinking that you can, like, you could just take that stuff and transfer it onto you and achieve the same results. A lot of times it's not going to work that way. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, revel in the successes that you are seeing. You know, I think that there are huge yeah. successes and some of the things that we see that happen in like a week or two weeks, like are, are pretty stunning. Like if you were taking medication and you got results like that from medication, it would be stunning. Like you're, you know, it would be like huge news. So the fact that you're doing it just by changing the way you're eating is, is really big. And we should, you know, we should really, um, uh, you know, pay more attention to that and give it more, um, you know, give it more credence. Yeah. I agree completely. Yeah. So for me, like, I think within days, um, energy and mood were the two things that I noticed, like that just were, that changed just right away. 
I and I know for me, um, energy was huge, and um, one of the biggest ones for me. I don't know if it happened like in a couple of days, but maybe in a few weeks or so, like my snoring got so much better. Mm. Yeah. To the point where, like now, like you guys, you've heard me cough a couple times. I might sound a bit congested. I'm getting over a cold. Um, this is the first cold that I've that has su- successfully infected my body in probably like four or five years or so. Like it's been a while. Um, hey, is it the uh, the big C? No, I don't. I don't think it is. I have not gotten tested for that, but I don't think I would be over it as quickly as I am getting over this one if it was actually that. Mm. You might if you um, were vaccinated. Yeah, and I am vaccinated, so it's possible. But um, the this like me being sick is like the only time that I snore. Other than that, I don't like, ever, and I really enjoy not snoring and not bothering whoever maybe around when I'm sleeping. I'm sure all of <laughs> whoever might be around appreciates that very much. <laughs> yes, I did this for them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I so that's something I've noticed too. Like I could never sleep um on my back. Like my entire life I couldn't sleep on my back. And uh, because I couldn't breathe, you know, and it was like I don't know. I mean, I guess I guess it was sleep apnea, but I feel like I would just stop breathing or, you know, it just was too much work to raise my chest and lower it and and everything. And, you know, and of course, when you hear about people being intubated and stuff, they, they have them laying on their stomach because it's, it, it's a lot of work to, for the lungs to press, push up a, a heavy chest. So I don't know. I mean, that was something that I noticed. But now, like, I almost exclusively sleep on my ba- back, and it's like no problem at all. And that's that. That's actually a huge change for me. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never could. I still don't really enjoy. I can sleep on my back, but I'm still going to turn my head one way to the side, mm-hmm. and I'm still a side sleeper, but. I do every once in a while fall asleep on my back and I never was able to. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't back. something I, I tried to do. It just kind of happened and now I wake up, I'm on my back. You know, not not on the side or anything like that. And I don't mm-hmm. enjoy sleeping on my stomach anymore. Oh yeah, I can't stand that. It hurts my back when I try. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so that's a good one. And then the next thing on the list was... Uh, so, ditch the scale, get a tape measure, there take you go. pictures. Um, yeah. This is another thing that I, I harp on, I preach about all the time. Uh, the scale is not your friend. Sometimes you will see changes. A lot of times you won't. It will be very discouraging in the times that you don't. Um, it'll be even more discouraging worse than no change is when that change is going in the wrong direction and that will happen sometimes yeah you're looking for that number to go down and it goes up you're like i don't i don't understand what's happening um i thought carnivore was supposed to make me lose weight and then you freak out um you need other measures of success and that's really what the tape measure is about that's what the taking pictures is about also that's um to 8A's point from the last tip, like that's where you need to be assessing your your mental health, the other, the intangible factors that you can't put a number on about um, like the intangible benefits that carnivore is giving. Is your energy still up? Are you still in a good mood every day? Um, like people mentioned sleep, is your sleep still good? Is your skin feeling better? Because a lot of us uh, come out of sad eating with all kinds of skin problems, autoimmune issues. How do your joints feel? How does your body feel? Like all of those things need to be taken into account. And if your main focus is weight and aesthetics, which it is for a lot of us, it's fine. You need to be doing more than just measuring your mass, your weight that is going to change it's going to fluctuate often by a couple pounds easily Uh, some people can see a couple pound difference day to day going up and down so 
you need to be measuring yeah. your body. Just buy a tape measure if they're cheap. Yeah. I totally agree. And I think it's really interesting. Like, I can see, the, especially, you know, the people that I'm working with, I can see, like, from week to week, looking at pic- their pictures, I can see a significant difference. And there may not be changes going on on the scale, but there absolutely are massive changes happening in the body. And um, I know that people are very attached to the number on the scale. They're very attached to this concept of the scale. But, you know, I'm kind of, I don't know, I don't really know what to say anymore. You know, all I can say is, you know, nobody sees that number on the scale but you. But everybody can see how tight your pants are. So if you're busting out of your pants, like, doesn't matter what that number is. That number could be smaller, but you could have gotten fatter. (laughs) And you could still be busting out of your pants. So, um, you know, how you look in your clothes and how your body looks is, is more important both aesthetically and also tells you more about your ac- actual health. So looking at a picture yeah. will tell you more about what's happening with your body than looking at a number on the scale. So, yeah. You know. So I yeah. urge you, uh-huh. yes take other use other data points just get get away from the scale especially with carnivore because they i think the people are particularly um i don't know resistant to weight loss <laughs> on the scale on carnivore like it just it oh, yeah. might only be a couple of pounds for a while but you'll still be losing lots of inches enough that people notice like they'll you know it'll be very distinctively noticeable it's not like it's gonna go unnoticed Right. Like, let go of your need to control things and understand that even in this process, you are not the boss. Your body is going to do what it feels like doing. And for a lot of mm-hmm. people, when they first start eating uh, carnivore, like the body says, Look, I'm getting more protein than I've ever gotten before. I'm getting more nutrients than I've ever gotten before. They are not, the body is not worried about, all right, let's get down to 150 now. Bet mm-hmm. I've been waiting for this forever. That is yeah. not how it's going. Like the folks, um, uh, me field mama and um, Anne, I think had the one had hyperthyroidism and one had hypo. Mm-hmm. Like your body's gonna be worried about those things first. Mm-hmm. Not getting away, not getting rid of that belly fat that has been nagging you forever. Like, yeah, relax. Um, and yeah, it's not gonna. A lot of times, it's not gonna go in mm-hmm. the uh, in. It's not going to go with the schedule that you wanted to. Yeah, absolutely. And I see Nichelle says, are you talking about me? And I say, <laughs> uh, you know, th- this is a common complaint that I see, you know, throughout um, the Facebook group, across, you know, the YouTube and across everywhere. Like, this is a, just a common, a common concern. So, um, yes, you and yes to millions of other people who have these same, you know, questions and concerns. And, it, you know, and it's not it's not surprising. I mean, this is how uh, our this is how our health has been judged for. I don't know, whenever mm-hmm. scales became commonly accessible to people, you know, I mean, this is yeah. when you go to the doctor, the first thing they do is, you know, check your weight and your height. So. It's not surprising, but it's not going to be helpful to you to to focus on that. So, mm. yeah, yeah. And you're right. Your body is going to focus on what it deems most important. And that's a good thing because your body is far clearer on what's going on inside than you are. <laughs> and certainly clearer than what you, your doctor thinks. Um, you know, the. I mean, I, we have to remember that our body is constantly, constantly healing and um all we have to do is get out of the way and when yeah. uh, you know and certain things will happen where the balance gets tipped and your body you know is not winning against whatever it is that's attacking us and that's when you have to like get medication or you ultimately you know potentially expire but um but otherwise your body is in a constant state of healing and we just have to get out of the way and what we're doing on the carnivore diet is removing the kinds of foods 
that actually cause harm. And so that allows your body to start healing. And so your body might decide, you know, you might think, I want to lose 50 pounds right away. And your body might say, oh, finally, you know, let's get to clearing out this liver. Let's take care of these organs. Let's fix this stuff that's going on in the brain. And let's fix all this Mm -hmm. other stuff. And then, you know, and then the rest of it we can get to. So... And maybe, you know, and why isn't that okay? Like, if, if you were at, you know, a critical health point with those things, like, that should be where you focus, right? It would make sense. But, yeah. no, we, um, like you said, it's not surprising. Society yeah. works one way, um, and it's, it's just, that stuff is especially the um, pushed on women. So... Yeah. You come into it just looking for I mean all all that other stuff's great, but I'm trying to lose weight. I'm mm-hmm. trying to get down to a number and when I get to that number I will be happy. You don't know what happiness is yet. You you have yet to find the actual happiness of being healthy. And it's yeah. it's not gonna you're not gonna hit it once that number hits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we you know, we don't control it. Our body's in charge, so um but now <clears throat> the next one well we already talked oh. about listening to your body so you said after removing the sugar's influence you can listen to your body so i right. there is this movement about intuitive eating and you know listening to your body and i think that is great but if you are still in the grips of a sugar addiction then your body is only going to say i need more m&ms yeah. i need oreos yeah. I need more M&Ms. And so you can't do intuitive eating until you take out the sugar. <laughs> but then it, yeah. it is quite, you know, it's quite effective. And I think it is very clear about what you need. It is, it will send you sound signals that you should act on and you should trust completely. If you're not hungry, you're not hungry. If you're not thirsty, you're not thirsty. Please don't get started on these, like, drink a gallon a day, 75 hard challenges. Like, that is terrible, terrible advice. And it specifically doesn't work for carnivore because, you know, yeah. you're really at risk for knocking your, messing up your electrolytes because you're drinking all this extra water that you don't necessarily need. If you're thirsty for a gallon of water, that's fine. But if you're not, you're going to cause yourself problems. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, that's, that's basically it. And that's why I put that there just because um, we've had this conversation before and I'll say, eat intuitively and you'll say well wait a minute you got to make sure sugar's not in the way first yeah sugar will cloud your mind sugar will have you intuitively you'll be you'll be thinking that you're listening to your intuition when you go out at two in the morning to get a slice of cake yeah yeah that's not you have to understand that sugar is not good for you um yeah not overall and especially not in the ways that it's available in modern society like refined sugar um it's very rare that folks are going out late at night or having a craving for fruit. It's normally <laughs> for something processed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they might they might do that for mangoes and cherries and grapes, but those are super oh, yeah. high in sugar. They're super high in mm-hmm. sugar. So, um, but yeah, that's a great point. Once you got to get off the sugar. Um, and then, you know, I mean, it's the same thing as if you were trying to, you know, deal with somebody or try to help somebody get off drugs. Like you can't really do therapy or any of that stuff until they're off the drugs. Cause when they're high, right. there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. Um, okay. So the next one was, um, so I see, I do see a lot of people doing very, very, very restrictive things on carnivore. And I don't think that's necessary unless you know, you've tried all of the regular stuff and you need to go very restrictive. So beef, mm-hmm. salt, and water is, is tasty and it's fine, but you don't have to do that. You don't have to start there. You don't ever have to do it if you don't want to. It, it yeah. is not necessary. Um, beef is great. Any ruminant animal is fine, but eggs are good. Fish is good. All kinds of things are good. So don't feel like you have to do that. And, um, and I do see people like... I mean, I guess it's sort of a, I don't know, it's kind of a hobby for people to do like these sort of biohacking or, 
you know, really strenuous, hard things. So I'll see people do like an egg fast or right now there's a bacon fast going on. And I just, um, you know, if that's what you want to do and that's, and you feel like that is, um, helping you, you can give it a try, but I don't think, you know, from what we've seen, the vets who've been around for a while, like, it's just not going to feel very good. You know, you can survive on only beef. I don't think that you can survive comfortably on only pork. Um, yeah. yeah I don't think so. At so, least, I'll put it this way. Arian couldn't. Yeah. I've got, I've got pork ribs in my refrigerator right now that I don't really feel like eating because I'm over pork for now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've never over beef. That's true. I, yeah, I'm never bored of it. Um, and I would eat more lamb if it didn't cost a million dollars. Oh, so if I, yes, lamb. <laughs> if I lived in a different country, like if I lived in, I don't know, Australia or something, like, yeah, that would be all I'd eat. I'd have no problem with that. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so don't, uh, so if you're coming into this and you're new and you're feeling like, oh, I'm not losing weight, I want to lose this weight, you know, let me get more restrictive. I don't know if that is helpful. Like, I don't think that that's the helpful way to get more restrictive. Um, if you wanted to, well, first you have to make sure you're fat adapted. So before you start playing around with any of these other things, you have to make sure that you have been in ketosis long enough for a long enough extended period that your body's good at burning fat. Because if before it's good at burning fat, you're not going to be able to force it to do anything else. So, um, and so that usually means like anywhere from a month to two months of straight being in ketosis, eating carnivore diet, eating as much as you need to, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I see Arian, you say fasting isn't necessary. Yeah. Michael Cross had actually said he's looking to start carnivore eventually, but he wants to start with keto. How do you recommend I start fasting or should I just dive right in? Um, and yeah, for that purpose, I don't think anybody needs to, a lot of people have this idea for some reason that to start a new way of eating, they should not eat at first. I don't get the logic there. I think the idea is to be for either to do a cleansing or I think people think of fasting as sort of, um, a little bit of punishing. So it's a way of like, I don't know, kind of whipping your body into shape. That's kind of how mm-hmm. I, that's the language that I kind of hear around it. And so, yeah, so people do feel like they need to do a cleanse before they start a new way of eating. And um, fasting is, is one way of cleansing as well. Although, you know, people also, so, I mean, someone recently asked me if they should start a, do a, um, a green juice smoothie cleanse before they started carnivore. And I was just like, I, like you gotta watch some more of my videos. Like, I, I think that answer should be pretty clear to you by now, but maybe not. Maybe I failed yeah. somehow in my communications. Yeah. So no, so just- don't do a green smoothie um, <laughs> cleanse before you start the carnivore diet. I know that's not what you're saying, Michael, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, uh, other people. Yeah. Right. And just in general, um, if you agree with the idea that there is a such thing as a better way of eating and that you could just do it, why would you prolong doing it? what's the there, there's no logical reason if you know what better is and you know that you could just go do better right now why would you then say well instead of doing that let me do this completely different thing for two weeks first and then go on to better no do better right now yeah right now not tomorrow yeah not in a week not tonight right now like, I'm going to start talking like the guy in that Everest College commercial. <laughs> like, don't do it now. Don't, don't wait. Do it right now. Well, I think that people are thinking that, like, carnivore is going to be a diet that they do for a while. It's on a lifestyle. And that they're going to do it for, um, 
you know, and, and that it's going to be hard. And so it's something that they're forcing themselves to do. And so mm-hmm. I think that's that mindset, you know, but once you get into it, you see that like, you know, I mean, I guess some people say they miss vegetables and people ask me from time to time, like, you know, do you, d- don't you miss vegetables? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like miss no. vegetables? <laughs> no. no, like there is no <laughs> vegetable I miss. Now, if you ask me if I miss donuts, chocolate, you know, candy and cake, yes. Right. You know, yes. <laughs> but I don't know, but I don't miss, you know, I don't miss Brussels sprouts, string beans, salad. You know, I miss, I miss maybe the texture of crunchiness, you know, but I don't miss, no, there's no vegetable I miss. And the the plant matter that i do miss i miss because i miss the sweetness but i also remember that when i smoked more cigarettes and drank more alcohol i didn't have as much desire for sweet because it was being satisfied by a different drug so i realized that none of this is about the food it's about what's going on up here for me so you know and so when i understand it that way it's like you know even the cake, the cookies, and the candy, and whatever. Yeah, it's not a thing. So, yeah. um, so no, I don't miss. I don't miss vegetables. <laughs> I can't think the of idea- a vegetable that I miss. <laughs> and I don't mean to be mean, but the idea that I would like miss a vegetable is like it's almost mm-hmm. insulting. <laughs> in in how like comical yeah. it is. Like yeah, what? I would miss the. I, I, I miss balsamic vinaigrette. Yes, the part that you have to struggle through to get to the good right. stuff. Yeah, no. I mean, I miss the sauces and the condiments that went on it. I miss the ketchup, which was full of sugar, you know. But I mm-hmm. realize all of it is sugar. The, all of the things that I miss are sugar, and that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So somebody asked, I saw somebody ask if we, when we say not fasting, if we also mean um, intermittent fasting. So I guess we should probably clarify what we mean when we use the words fasting or intermittent fasting. So I think on a bare minimum, uh, we probably all agree that everyone should be able to go from dinner to breakfast without eating. And so at a bare minimum, everybody should be going 14 hours without eating. And then, um, you know, some people can benefit by going 16 hours or 18 hours. But I think when you get past 18 hours, that's where, um, you know, differences of opinion come in. So um, there's uh, so with, on carnivore, we encourage you to eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full. And if you're only hungry once every 24 hours, that's it. You, that's that's as often as you're hungry. So you may go a long period without eating, but you're not like artificially deciding when you're going to eat and not eat until that time period. You're just going to wait for your appetite. So that, um, so that approach includes, um, fasting, but we're just not using the word fasting. It's just, you're not hungry or you're hungry, but you know, when you get to the point of fasting like you know 48 hours or uh, or more you're you know you're gonna be hungry like there's no getting around that so i don't think we so we're not really encouraging that those longer fasts although some people do them and they have great success with it so if you feel like you can do it and it doesn't trigger disordered eating for you and you don't risk like um you know going off plan and eating something because you're hungry and you and you're not able to withstand the cravings then uh you know then it's fine but if that is a problem for you you know i wouldn't do it and you don't need to do it in order to be successful you know if you want to do it you can but you don't need to do it to be successful yeah um so yeah i'm of the belief that for the most part i want people to like just fall into some sort of fasting regime like Mm -hmm. i fell into Mm -hmm. sorry two meals a day uh, mm-hmm. It works out very easily for me. First meal is sometime from 10 to 12 o'clock. Second meal is sometime from about 4 to 7. And I'm great. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Don't eat in between, and I'm not bothered. Some people fall into OMAD. It's just how their body works, and that's great, too. 
yeah, I'm definitely, I'm more, I have no problem with really any sort of inter- intermittent fasting, even OMAD, just my one worry, my one frustration with OMAD is a lot of new people try to do it because I think it sounds cool. And they just think, mm-hmm. well, that means I won't be eating for 23 hours out of the day. That must be so much better than not eating for 12 hours out of the day or 16. Um, but then they fall into problems because OMAD doesn't work for a lot of people. Mhm. Yeah. Well, so for people who don't like cooking, then OMAD, you know, that might be a thing that really is worth it because you can just, you know, stop. Um and you don't have to deal with like food prep. And it, it, it you know, that is a big, you know, a big chunk of the time of our day. Um but if you like the, you know, the process of making food and food prep and all of that, then you might not like to do, you know, OMAD or something like that because you want to eat more. So, you know, it's kind of up to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's see what's um, the other one. Next, oh, eat well, enough food. On, next is eat yeah. enough food. Yes. So with all of this fasting, you just need to make sure that you're actually eating enough food. I can't tell you how many times people are like, I'm, you know, I'm feeling fatigued. I'm feeling like Uh, you know, I don't have enough energy and my head's kind of foggy. And then you look at what they're eating and it's like, this is not enough food. You have to eat. You have to eat. Yeah. Which is one reason why OMAD doesn't work for some folks. It's a lot of food to try to eat at one time. And they will actually find that they do better if they eat um, multiple meals a day and just accept that they're not going to fast as long. That doesn't mean that you're losing in carnivore. Like people need Mm -hmm. to eat People, uh, most folks I find um, very quickly find that they need to eat a lot more in carnivore and I also find that to like especially go for women mm-hmm. yeah and I think it's important too to remember that y- you know your body is changing and healing and all this stuff is happening and so um, you can't expect that you're going to eat the same from you know the beginning of your journey to the end so you may need to when you start your journey you may need like two and a half pounds of meat but as you lose Mm -hmm. weight and get healthier and heal you may find that you you only need one and a half pounds of meat later on or one pound of meat and so um you know when you used to need to eat twice a day now you maybe only need once a day you know it's it's kind of up to you and your ability to eat larger amounts of food changes as well you know you're um you may not be able to sit down and eat a two and a half pound steak in the beginning please don't do that because that will make you sick but over time you may very well be able to do that and um and you may be able to do omad so things change you know and don't so don't expect everything to be really static yeah uh your needs are going to change all the time but in general um I'm starting to believe that most people can benefit from more salt and more protein. Like, whatever you think you're doing, if you believe it's enough, try a little more and see how that does. It seems to just about always be a good thing. Yeah. Agreed. Absolutely. Um, And I see in the chat, like, uh, sorry, I got behind and kind of skipped over some things. So, uh, Kelly was asking a, a number of questions about, uh, well, how vegan or how carnivore compared to veganism about how to keep blood glucose in line, um, while eating this way. And, uh, yeah, there are a number of questions. So it mm-hmm. sounds like Kelly, you need to, um, get a little bit more caught up on, you know, what is ketosis and why it's beneficial because, you know, that's the the crux of your question there. I mean, when you're asking about things that to do with diabetes, you're you're essentially asking about uh about that. So you definitely want to do some more research there. But, you know, essentially the benefits of a carnivore diet in my opinion are one the benefits that you get from being in ketosis and that is, you know, reversing the chronic disease that Um, you know, are caused by lifestyle. So things like diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, and heart disease and, um, and, you know, reversing that insulin resistance that's causing that. And then two, the benefit of carnivore that you don't get necessarily on keto 
is removing those foods um, that irritate and or cause allergies for people. And um, if you, uh, if so those of you who are watching, I don't know if you saw the episode I did with Sally Norton um, last week or the week before, but I, I suggest you go back and look at that and really um, consider how oxalates might be playing a role in your health. So there are a number of anti-nutrients that are a problem for people. Oxalates is one, phytates is another, lectins is another, um, gluten is another, uh, you know, and there are others beyond that. So, um, you know, when, <laughs> so a lot of people have, you know, different kind of responses to these different anti-nutrients and oxalates, um, you know, are particularly, you know, bad and harmful, but they're not the only ones. So carnivore gives you an opportunity to pull all of that out of your diet and your body is able to heal and recover from it. And then, um, and then, you know, you can begin the assault again. <laughs> it's up to you. Um, <laughs> but those are, you know, those are the benefits I see from the carnivore diet. So particularly people with autoimmune stuff seem to do really, really, really well on the carnivore diet. Um, and, uh, you know, once they remove those things, those foods, whatever they are, you know, and they're different things for different people, but, um, you know, whatever those things are, they, they seem to get better. Yeah, I would say um, the one thing that I kind of want to, I wonder if we can hit this fast, is that, so she asked about, so she was asking about controlling blood sugar and saying that, well, if I, like, where am I going to get my carbs from, and I'm diabetic, so if I don't need some sort of sugar in my blood levels, my sugar level will drop, and then, so I have to have some of the sugar to keep my glucose normal. Um, that is a, like, telltale sign of an insulin spike. Like, you eat more sugar than your body can handle so your sugar level goes up too high so then you have an insulin spike insulin smacks that sugar down which sends it all off into your fat cells and um your body has an overreaction to the amount of sugar that you had so now you are under sugar you are hypoglycemic um that those spikes and then the subsequent uh I guess the trough is the word if we're talking about waves. I don't know what the opposite of the spike is, but that dip in blood sugar is going to be a lot less pronounced if it even um, really happens to any noticeable level when your body is not getting sugar. So then, like somebody said in the comments, uh, this is Mommy Does Keto, you ever produces all the sugar that you need, you don't have to consume it. That is completely true. What may happen though, and Mommy Does Keto did point this out, is that if you're on any sort of blood sugar medication, any insulin medication, you're going to need to work with your doctor to lean those down. Sometimes that happens really quickly. A person, a diabetic person, starts carnivore. They really are doing a good job of controlling their carbs, and within like a week or two, they need to pull their medication down. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it is really fast, so um, you can't just kind of you know, expect that, you know, over time you'll deal with it. It, it could be like within a week. So, uh, you have to do that. And, um, you know, and I think that doctors are getting more knowledgeable. So if you go yeah. in and say, you say you want to use keto to get off your blood, you know, your diabetic medication, more likely you'll get someone who says, Oh, okay. I, I think I know what that means. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, but then I, then there are some random people, like there's somebody in our group who said that, uh, her doctor was a carnivore and just, you know, suggested it. And oh, I mean, perfect. this wasn't, I know. And this was not like one of the doctors that's out there, you know, that's got a YouTube channel and stuff. It was just a regular doctor. So I'm like, well, hmm. who is that? And does <laughs> Is his patient load full? Can I sign up? Right. Like, does he do telemedicine now? I more people that way. Yeah, I know. So, but, you know, there are out there. But, you know, I find a lot of them, um, they may do it themselves, but they still don't recommend it for patients. And, like, mm -hmm. my mom's doctor, like, I had been begging her and trying to get her to do keto for, like, for years. And her doctor was keto. <laughs> But still didn't mm. want my mom to do it because she was worried that my mom would like fall out or have all of these problems. And, and she had terrible keto flu in the beginning. 
Um, but that's because she wouldn't, she didn't want to do any of the things that I told her to do. Because, <laughs> like, why do you listen to your children? <laughs> you know, they don't know anything. They don't know anything. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so she never really did it, you know. Um, yeah. So that kind of mm. sucks. But, um, yeah, so who knows what your doctor might say. But you're going to have to find a doctor who will say okay to helping you get off. Because, um, you know, you, you, can't, you can't really do it on your own. Or you shouldn't do it yeah. on your own. It could be dangerous. But that being said, yeah. people do stuff all the time. <laughs> that I is mean, reckless and crazy. So, you know, if that's right. what you do. But we advise you not to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I, we do not provide medical advice. We are not doctors. Um, that said, though, there seem to be a good number of people who have made it work with or without a doctor. So, so I see uh, Kelly said, I went to a bariatric surgeon the other day, and he told me if I go through with the surgery that I have to eat a high-protein diet for the rest of my life. Um, probably. Uh, but you can probably eat this way and not get the surgery and get the results that you're looking for. So, um, yeah. I would, I would encourage you to give this a try and see, you know, see if it works for you. Um, you know, the, uh, who is that doctor? Dr. Saivez, I think he operates out of Florida. He is yeah. a pediatric bariatric surgeon. So he, he does, um, the, the weight loss surgery for kids and um but he also treats adults and um if you're specifically looking at that route that might be somebody you reach out to 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 mm -hmm. talk about that um there's definitely a lot of people in our community who have had a weight loss surgery and who are following this way of eating so it's totally possible you know whatever um whatever surgery you've had and um and it may be possible to to lose the weight you want without um without going into surgery um you know but yeah. that's up to you but that's definitely a conversation you should have with somebody who is knowledgeable about the surgery and the diet yeah i will find or not i will i have found and this is very interesting the protocol that they put you on before a bariatric surgery is a keto diet mm -hmm. it is yeah. a high protein keto diet so you yeah. could just do that right now without the doctor telling you to do it. No. I know. I remember I had been like begging my mom to do keto and she wouldn't do it. And then she went to some fancy place and they gave her this plan. And I was looking at it and I was like, this is a keto diet. And she's like, no, see, it says weight loss. And it's like, but it's a keto diet. They just are not calling it that. There's no carbs. There's no sugar. There's fat and there's protein. It's a keto diet. And she's like, no, no. And it's like, okay. No, this isn't that crazy quackery that you're doing. This is something. Yeah, it's a different yeah. kind of quackery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so uh, I think we have gone through a number of tips and tricks tonight, right? I think so. Oh, so last one. I don't think we touched this. Uh, and this will be an easy one. Experiment with different types and cuts of meat. So this kind of hits back on that one about no need to limit yourself to be salt water. Like if mm -hmm. something, uh, if you're starting to get bored, play around. Eat some seafood. Try some other red meat. Try some, some white meat. Like some people, they're, I don't really love it, but they're carnivores who love chicken still. They'll just, they'll roast the whole chicken and eat that thing with eat the entire thing in one sitting. <laughs> you just had wings tonight. I I did. Wings are wings are a special case because there's like there's either a, a buffalo sauce or some sort of dry rub on them. But like if you just gave me plain chicken mm -hmm. like it's boring. I didn't want it. Like my I just went to um a family friend had a graduation dinner. And mm -hmm. there was chicken there. And they were like, you don't want any chicken? Oh, hell no. I don't want chicken. There's, there's hamburgers and hot dogs and bratwurst all around. And you want me to eat chicken? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. 
Um, let's see. Mommy Does Keto says that her mom and sister had weight loss surgery and they're both still fat. Meanwhile, here's me. No surgery. Half my size with keto. Congratulations. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so what is the, well, so you've cooked some wild things. I've got to say, you know, your kidney and all of that. Um, I think for me, um, you know, I did some more complicated experimental things, but now I don't really feel like doing all that. So Mm -hmm. I'm pretty, I, I stick with my staples. Definitely. Yep. Uh, yeah. So I've done, I've had heart cooked like steak. I didn't really love it, but it was okay. I've had heart um, made into jerky. That was good. I like that. Um, And then, yeah, beef kidneys, beef liver. Uh, I tried making pate out of the liver. I used calf liver and beef liver. Didn't really like either. I have some chicken liver still that I will probably make pate with because I don't imagine I'm going to eat it any other way. And oh yeah, like goat, like fresh goat. Like I saw them cut the animal goat. Um, that's been cool. Like that made I made jerky out of that, and I cooked that. Like just roasted it, and it was good mm-hmm. both ways. Well, I see yeah. people are saying Esther loves chicken. Marianne loves butter chicken. So there are some chicken lovers in this group. Yeah, I don't get y'all, but you know what? Somebody's <laughs> got to eat all these chickens that we have in America, so y'all are picking yeah. up my slack, and I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it, too, because I also <laughs> don't eat much chicken. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, so everybody who is here, I hope that you got some great tips, and uh, I encourage you, you know, join the Facebook group, follow me on Instagram, follow me here on YouTube, and uh you know and stick around like there is a i'm so excited by how popular the carnivore diet has become but there definitely are some things that you got to do right in the beginning or it's going to be really hard and uh there's no reason to learn the hard way like you know people have done this we've paved the road we figured it out so don't do that you know just listen to us and then it can be super easy and you don't ever have to feel any of that transition stuff because you're going to get the stuff right you're going to eat enough you're going to have enough salt and you're going to you know eat the right kind of food and and it's going to be great and you're going to be really happy with the results wouldn't you say all right i definitely would agree mm -hmm. with that go ahead Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, if you need some more support or accountability, I do have a program. So reach out to me and, uh, you know, we can talk about whether it's right for you. But, um, you know, don't don't wait. Like, there's no reason to wait. Jump right in. Do this. It's only going to be good sooner. Don't wait two weeks or next month. Do it now. It's good. Do it now. Yeah. Do it now. Get off the couch. Do it now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, Kelly, I think uh, you would be a good candidate for the um, program that it has because it feels like you have a lot of questions and concerns that deserve to be answered. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able to get to all those answers on your own. Yeah, definitely. You know, some things are there's some unlearning that needs to be that needs to be done. And, um, you know, and I can tell by your questions, there's some things that you haven't, um, you, that you haven't learned yet or haven't been exposed to yet. So I definitely would help you with that. Um, all right. So, uh, so everybody on Tuesday, we have the next episode of the black carnivore podcast. We have another great, um, uh, interview coming out with, uh, another successful carnivore. So definitely look out for that. And I am bringing back Clubhouse. I know I flaked in the last two weeks. Um, you know, the previous week, the, the interview was too long and it ended up being, you know, being too late to get started with it. Um, so I would like to switch it to Friday afternoon. So I'd love to hear some feedback from all of you as to whether that would work for you. And I would begin next Friday, not this coming Friday. And, uh, and then, you know, so we'll see you on Tuesday for the interview. And, um, and I will see you uh, for the live stream next Thursday. Not, I may have another guest host, so we'll see. And if you're interested in being a guest host, let me know. 
All right, everybody. Have a great night, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.